I'd like to start out, if I could, with Rusty. We spoke earlier today, and I know you've told this story 10,000 times. I'm going to ask you to do it 10,001. Could you please tell everybody about that moment when the camera jammed, and there you are in the hatch, looking into space, looking back at the Earth, and the big picture of what the Apollo Space Pro Program was about and, and just what it meant to humanity. Okay, well, have to, <clears throat> excuse me, have to set uh, the scene a little bit. Apollo 9 was the first test flight of the lunar module, and I was fortunate enough to be the lunar module pilot. Uh, part of the uh, test during uh, Apollo 9 was the first flight of the Apollo uh, EVA suit, the new space suit that we had for Apollo, and I had the privilege of being the first guy to wear that outside and test it as well as the backpack that was on my back, which allowed uh, Charlie and uh, others uh, of my friends to run around on the moon later uh, without dragging an umbilical across the moon. Um, so part of that test, uh, fourth day on the mission, uh, I went outside to test all of that. And one of the things that uh, we were checking was whether we could transfer from the lunar module back over to the command module which was relatively essential since the command module was the only uh, one of the two vehicles that had a heat shield that could re-enter. And so therefore, getting back into the command module was essential if you wanted to come back to Earth. And um, so we had to, in case the tunnel, uh, something happened with the tunnel, we needed to be able to prove we could transfer externally. And uh, Dave uh, Scott, over in the command module, was taking a film of this. We had no digital devices in those days, so it was actual film. And the Mauer is a German movie camera. Uh, I got partway up the handrail on that transfer, and Dave uh, reported that the camera just jammed. And uh, so Jim McDivitt, inside the lunar module, said, OK, Dave. You got five minutes to try to unjam the camera. Rusty, stay right there. <laughs> yes, sir. So uh, for five minutes, uh, I realized that I was going to be unemployed in space. And uh, I, I strongly recommend it if you have the opportunity. Um, so I decided uh, just in spontaneously uh, to let go with my right hand, the handrail is like this, and I let go with my right hand and I just turned around, uh, and looked at the earth, beautiful earth, the sun was up here, uh, brilliant blue horizon over the earth, uh, absolutely spectacular. Uh, something you had to know was that the, with the backpack and the spacesuit, when no one was talking, uh, there was no sound at all. None of the fans and motors and things of that kind made any noise, really. You're floating inside a suit, which is floating, so that when you're not moving, you're not even aware that you have the suit on. You're floating like a pea in a pod. And um, no one was talking. Dave was doing his thing. I don't know what McDivitt was doing. I was just hanging out, looking at the beautiful Earth. And it was completely silent. And um, I said... My real responsibility here is to absorb what's happening. I'm a human being. Forget astronaut for the moment. I'm a human being. What's going on here? And a whole bunch of questions came floating in, like, how did I get here? Why am I here? What's really going on? And I didn't try to answer those questions, but what I realized was that these were not simple issues. When I thought, what do I mean by I? Is it me who is here, or is it us who are here? Uh, when it's, how did I get here, it's not the Saturn V or the American taxpayers. It's humanity and our creation and our partnership with machines that we've created that has allowed humankind to move out into environments of this kind. Humanity from the time of Apollo 
uh, it was very interesting to hear Laura earlier and Andy talking about you know, the creation of fire and things of that kind of wheel. 10,000 years from now, this will still be the moment in history when humanity first stepped into space, when life from planet Earth first went out. So, so while, Lee, while, thank you for asking the question, but while we celebrate something that we were part of, in a sense, 50 years ago, uh, this is one of those events in human history that happens one time, and if we don't wipe ourselves out 10,000, 100,000 years from now, whatever we become through evolution at that time, this will still be the unique moment in time when life from planet Earth first moved out into space. Thank you. Thank you, Rusty. Fred, I wanted to go back now that we've had this wonderful big picture view. I want to go back to that initial challenge from President Kennedy. And I want to get your thoughts. Um, as that challenge was laid out, did you think it was doable? Was it realistic? Did you just want to dive into it? What were your thoughts on that? Uh, at the time, I was a NASA test pilot uh, at Flight Research Center, now named Armstrong, after Neil, uh, at, near Edwards, California. And uh, I heard that, and just knowing where we had the X-15 program, uh, it had gotten over 50 miles a couple of times. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> that was my thoughts about it, from where, where we were with technology, and uh, what we had accomplished uh, at that time uh, as far as moving outward. So I said, you know, I said it was mission impossible to me. I, uh, I saw nothing at hand that would even, hardware-wise certainly, that would closely be able to do what was uh, set out to do. So it was quite an um, amazing uh, thing that he went out on the limb on uh, and courage to uh, broadcast that, uh, obviously, to Congress and then down at Rice, uh, University uh, to, to turn that program on. We had we had one flight in space at that time, which did not went like the X-15, just went up and came back down with Al Shepard, and that was all that was under our belt uh, towards space. When he and, and one of the I guess the greater expanded rockets that the Russian uh, the uh, Germans had invented for World War II, uh, it wasn't anywhere near the kind of rocket we could use uh, for that endeavor. So to me, it was just an outstanding, uh, incredible, mission impossible uh, thing that he set us out to do. Thank you. So, a lot of the service and command modules did a lot of the testing. And I, I want to get your feel for, you know, were the simulations, did that give you enough confidence that you could actually execute these moves which would ultimately lead to a lunar landing? The program is so different than what the public at large seems to know today. Mm -hmm. For example, Apollo 7. Okay, it's listed up here as the first manned Apollo mission. That was the third attempt, the third uh, command module that we were on to get us to that point. So you understand kind of what you go through because the public at large doesn't get these details. Uh, we started off, Wally Sherrod, Don Isley and I, we were on the Apollo 2 crew. And that was gonna be the second one that flies after Apollo 1, of course. And it was Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. During the development, because this was so early in the program, this was development where we were working and practically living with the North American, North American Rockwell out in California to get the spacecraft ready. It was still in the design, still being fixed. And after we'd, we'd caused enough delays with the things we were trying to do by after seven or eight months that they canceled our mission. We were the Apollo 2, canceled out. About a week, no, I don't think it was even a week later, we were then assigned, we were the backup crew for Apollo 1. So as we were working with Apollo 1, and of course, most of you are aware of the fact that that crew died in a fire on the pad, uh, the, the spacecraft uh, was not as, 
as good as eventually it was when we flew, but we all thought we could still handle that spacecraft. Uh, so when that crew died after three months, maybe three and a half months, uh, about a week later, then we were assigned the first crew, the first mission. So uh, Wally Schraud, Don Isley, and I were then on the first mission. We started fixing everything we could, gave us some time to develop. It wasn't uh, uh, rapid enough to be able to get the lunar module ready in time, so it wasn't ready when we got there. But 21 months later, we flew all the fixes up. And that mission turned out to be uh, one of the most successful first missions that I can imagine. Mm -hmm. And uh, to this day, that's still the longest, the most ambitious, the most successful first test flight of any new flying machine you know, ever. And uh, we were glad that we had the opportunity to, uh, to do it. Uh, we didn't have the same kind of uncertainty that I think people today, when they ask, they're always asking me about you know, kind of like, were we afraid and things like that. Not really the case. We were all, we all in the program back in those days, we did the best we could to make it successful. We were aware of things that might be a problem, but that's the reason they worked out. Everybody was willing to pay the price, whatever it took to make that mission successful. And I'm, I'm glad that we had Apollo 7 as successful as it was. Thank you. <clears throat> Harrison, I want to fast forward to actually walking on the moon. For those of us who will never be able to experience anything like that, what's the sensation? Don't give up yet. Yeah? All right. Point taken. But, but take us to that moment. I mean, how vivid is it still in your mind? Um, what's the moment like? The Apollo 17 mission, which was the, uh, the last of the Apollo series, foreordained by a limited buy of the Saturn V rocket back in the Johnson administration, and some uh, three canceled flights later was scheduled and indeed did land in a deep mountain valley, spectacular place called Taurus Littrow. The mountains on the north went to uh, 1,600 meters, the mountains on the south to 2,100 meters, and if you want to convert that to feet, just multiply by three, and I'd probably do it wrong. Uh, it really was a spectacular place. The narrowest part of the valley where we landed was only about five miles wide little less than five miles. In fact, when the site was first being considered, what they call the Three Sigma error lips for landing actually would have potentially put us landing on the side of one of these mountains, and that, uh, that would not have been a good idea. Although those, those error limits were very conservative. We figured out a way, a navigation way that I won't go into, but uh, to uh, reduce that down to about a, uh, an error ellipse of about a kilometer radius and uh, that was fine. We could, uh, we could get into the valley. Uh, that the descent went extremely well. Uh, we uh, waited a little while while the uh, Mission Control Center, Jerry in particular, uh, decided that all our, that the Challenger systems were good and that we could stay. He really called it, see, it was up to him of whether we we're going to stay there or come home without anything. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether we would have listened to him or not, but uh, yeah. I suspect we would have. <laughs> the, uh, and so uh, pretty soon after landing, we were headed out, of, out, out the hatch and uh, down onto the lunar surface. Uh, my first step on the moon, the 12th person actually to do that, uh, happened to be on the side of a very smooth rock. And the lunar material, the lunar debris, the regolith as we call it, has small beads of glass in it, literally small ball bearings. And so my foot slipped out from <laughs> under me. I was still hanging on the ladder, so I didn't <laughs> fall then. I fell many times later, but not, not then. Walking on the moon in a valley like Taurus Littrow or anywhere is like walking on a giant trampoline. 
Uh, I presume almost everybody here has been on a trampoline at some time or other. But just imagine that experience, but no limits on how far you can go. I had uh, found that uh, very quickly that the best way to run across the moon was as if you were cross-country skiing. Uh, you could glide just above the surface uh, and take longer and longer strides with a good toe push. We got some cross-country skiers in the audience, I'm sure, up in these north countries. And so you, you can get an idea for that. I could never convince my pilot colleagues <laughs> that that was the way to run, an efficient way to run on the moon. For some reason, they like to hop. What was that all about, Walt? That's because we could never teach you how to fly. <laughs> Get that man a moon ball. <laughs> you know, Walt is, is a marine pilot. Okay? And I can't say anything about, about that because my dad was a World War I Marine. <laughs> But he rode horses. <laughs> he was in the cavalry. At any rate, Walt. Well, <clears throat> <laughs> That's the horse marine. Yeah, the horse marines. Yeah, he was a horse marine. The last company, 7th Regiment, 7th Marines, 90th Company. Where did we get into that? The, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, so you understand that if when you get to the moon, practice your cross-country skiing. Now, the, the thing that's spectacular about our, our valley anyway, and I think it's probably true almost anywhere on the moon, is that you, you work, at least Apollo worked, in a brilliant sun, as brilliant as any New Mexico sun you can imagine. But the sky is black, absolute black. That's hard to get used to. We're, we grow up with blue skies. <laughs> and I never really felt comfortable with a black sky. But in that black sky, of course, was this beautiful, small planet, seemingly small planet Earth, always hanging over the same part of the valley. And uh, anytime you felt a little bit homesick, you could look up and say, yeah, home's only 250,000 miles away. <laughs> Thank you. Milt, you can give it to Milt. Milt, can you give us an idea of the role of, fli of flight director and also how it evolved? I mean, you went from eight all the way to 15, and how it evolved over the years and some of the different memories you have. Okay, but remember, uh, by the time I got there on eight, all these veterans had already uh, showed the way pretty well. Uh -huh. But uh, the, one thing, it's, it seems to be a common misconception is that the flight control team was run by one person all seven or eight or 15 days, right. whatever it was, and that's not true. That's what you get from the movies. But we had uh, the missions divided up into different mission phases. For example, launch or lunar descent or EVA or, or rendezvous, whatever it was. And we had teams assigned to each one of those mission phases and those teams uh, didn't change. Like I had the maroon team, Jerry had the gold team, we had Lunny with the black team, and there was a whole group of people assigned to the maroon team, for example, and uh, and we worked together through the whole mission. So it was a, a matter of uh, uh, dividing up the activity into something you could really understand, and and you had to work to. Uh, build a flight plan up uh, to accomplish the goals, uh, particularly true when you talk about the, all these three EVAs that they had on the later flights, uh, that was a big deal to, to put all that stuff together and decide what you had to do and to get all the scientists to agree on whatever it was, which is not very easy. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, they, uh, uh, it, it was something that, that you did. Each team together, uh, simulated and uh, had a lot of problems thrown at them, which fortunately were worse than what we had on the flights. So uh, I think as uh, as the time progressed, of course, everybody felt more comfortable with what they were doing. We got more experience each flight. And, and uh, one of the things that made the Apollo work real well 
two of them really, a little more than that, but one was anticipating of what was going to happen and trying to uh, figure out the right uh, added, uh, right uh, approach to take to various failures. But, and the other one was that we invariably, after a flight, went back and, and, and did lessons learned. And we tried real hard to discuss that among ourselves and, and, and come up with a, uh, improvements. And so that we were always getting better, I think. And uh, I think Jerry said this one time, he may not remember he said it, but by the time 13 came and we had the real serious problem, uh, we were really a, a pretty, it's a trite expression, I guess, but a really finely honed machine. Mm. We, everybody knew what they were doing, I think, by that time. And uh, we thought we did, and I think we did. So as we progressed through the various missions, we got more and more competent. And, uh, and, and because we were still trying to learn and to take note of what mistakes we made, and there were some mistakes, but, but anyway, we, we were trying diligently to improve. And Thank I you think both. we did. Thank you. Jerry, uh, can you take us, you have a, an incredible description of, um, of a goosebump moment uh, during Apollo 11 when you knew that you were there, uh, or that we, you know, the, the Apollo space program was there. We were going to land on the moon. It was going to happen. Can you describe that? Yeah, I, um, uh, and I've been asked that question. I know everybody up here has. Uh, what did you think the moment, the, the pivotal moment was in Apollo 11? And I've got an odd one. Um, it wasn't when Neil stepped out on the Grumman provided pad um, or when he stepped on the uh, surface. During the descent, Buzz was reading out altitude and descent rate. He read that about every, I think you guys did that probably every 15 seconds or so, so that the, the commander could look outside and focus on the surface where he was trying to land the vehicle. and. And the LMP, the lunar module pilot, helped uh, by looking in, uh, inside and getting the descent rate and the altitude. They got down to about 40 feet, somewhere in that area. And uh, Buzz was reading out 1,000 feet, three feet a minute down, blah, 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 all the way down. But around 40 feet, he made a call in between two of his uh, status calls and he said picking up some dust mm. and when he said that uh, it sent a chill up my back and it still does when I just said it um, I remember feeling we've got humans in a spacecraft with an engine that's blowing dust and that I thought then even though we were running low on fuel, we're gonna land. This is it. We're gonna. It's gonna happen. So it was that that moment that I wasn't expecting. Mm -hmm. I mentioned it to Buzz in later years, and he said the reason he said the sun was coming from behind us and going under, so it made the dust very visible. And he said that's why he said he just said it in a in a heartbeat. But it was it was really a neat moment. Thank you, Jerry. Charlie, how does that rover handle? Well, uh, everybody says, how was it driving the rover? John wouldn't let me touch the steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> he was the driver and I was the navigator. So I had a set of maps and uh, point A to point B. And when we were driving along the surface, uh, we didn't have any uh, TV. It was the antenna was bouncing around. And so I was the travel guide and my audience, uh, my travel people were in mission control and 250,000 miles away. So now we're passing on the right here and I would just give this traveling uh, travelogue about what <laughs> we were seeing as we drove from point A to point B. 
And also, uh, I was taking pictures every 50 meters or so. And so my job was to get us from A to B and to describe to Mission Control what we were seeing while we were driving. While John was driving, I really had the best job because uh, our, our photographs on Apollo uh, 16 that were taken from Apollo 14 had a uh, resolution of uh, 45 feet. So everything less than 45 feet you couldn't see in the photographs. So as we were going across the moon, we were, and this landing, we were seeing a lot of stuff less than 45 feet and, uh, you know, could swallow a lunar module. And so we, as we drove around, John had to weave around and get us from, get us around these craters and uh, uh, never got uh, close rocks. To never got close to flipping it, did you? No, it never, never felt like it was going to roll over, but it's, it fishtailed <laughs> a lot like this. And uh, so uh, the car, it, it worked tremendously well. It was a great, uh, from Apollo 15, 16, and 17, we had a car which really revolutionized lunar exploration. Prior to that time, you had to walk everywhere. And, uh, uh, and it, walking was uh, not the easiest thing uh, on, the, on the lunar surface. Uh, Jack had uh, his way of, of skiing. Uh, up a hill, I hopped. Going down a hill, I skipped on the on the lunar flat, it was like Frankenstein for me, you know, just big, big stiff-legged stuff. So everybody had their their uh, uh, their technique of walking around on the moon, and uh, but thankfully the lunar module, uh, the lunar rover, was really a, a, a revolutionary opportunity for all of Apollo to see so much. Uh, and I just want to say to all of the Grumman folks here that worked on that, you guys get a great machine, let me tell you. <laughs> when I came up here for the first time, my southern accent and the Yankee accent up here didn't, I, well, I, 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 what are they talking about, you know? And uh, But I realized what they were talking about was the right thing to talk about, and they did a fantastic job. And so uh, we became all good friends. And uh, anyway, uh, the uh, Lunar Rover was a uh, great machine, and uh, John and I, I think we set the moon high, uh, the moon speed record. <laughs> However, on Apollo 17, they argued, no, we did. So we share the record for the moon speed record because the odometer only went to 17 kilometers per hour <laughs> and we were both all scale high. So <laughs> <laughs> did, did the rover come back or is it? No, it's, it's a, still up there. Okay. There are three rovers up there. So if you want to Eight million dollar car with a dead battery. We can tell you where to go. <laughs> Get one. And Thanks, Charlie. It, 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 yeah. it was only, uh, the rover was like 10 feet long, 5 feet wide, mm. and the hatch was like 30 inches around, so you couldn't get the rover back in. It gotcha. was left on the moon. Gotcha. Thank you. Fred, can you take us um, into the Apollo 13 mission? The explosion happens, and from my studies, there was never any talk about not getting home, losing an astronaut, anything like that. Can you explain the teamwork? Or just I know it's a lot to answer, but can you give us some insight into what that was like as you guys had to assume that task? Uh, the, the teamwork part, you, you'd a actually have to share. Uh, I guess primary guys, uh, uh, Gene Krantz was on duty when this happened, and the other guy who played a great role was Glenn Lunny. I think uh, Jerry, uh, you, you, you kid, kid of mine, I know I've been on the stage with uh, 
three of you. And Jerry, you always, you always turn the cramps and say, I gave you a good vehicle. And Lonnie chimes in and says, you gave me, you gave me a piece of junk. <laughs> but uh, no, the, the situation uh, was not life-threatening. At, at the point of time, uh, we, we clearly had lost one tank, so my major uh, feeling was sick to my stomach with disappointment. I knew we had lost the landing. And uh, from then, we went into a troubleshooting mode for almost an hour, uh, trying to stop the leak in the second tank. And I had uh, had an opportunity probably 25, 30 years later, uh, I dug out the emission control tapes. I wanted to listen predominantly the ECOM loop uh, on what was going on. And that was a classical uh, set of arguments going on, professional arguments, I'd say between the, uh, the group that within the room, the mission control, and they had another support room off on a side room, uh, more burning power, and they were wrestling with what to do next. And of course, there's always the caution, you never want to do anything next that's going to make things worse. And so that was what the argument was going on. I, I knew, personally, I could recognize some of the voices. So I knew the people. And near the end of that hour, when they, it became clear they had run out of ideas, I could just hear the deflation in their voices. They went down, and that's when uh, Glenn Lunny, another flight director, called them back to duty and said, you got to get this thing shut down, uh, the mothership he was talking about, the command module. And now they had another interesting problem because it was never planned to be shut down, so they didn't have any book to reach for on how to shut this thing down. So they now had to go into an air living, but their voices came right back as active and with beating this new challenge and took it on. And they were worried, of course, on the, it was easy to shut it down if you just pull all the circuit breakers on the main buses and the battery buses. But they were kind of thinking through, we don't want to hurt anything while we're doing this process. So that went on and they obviously uh, successfully got it turned off. We had the limb, I was never worried because uh, I knew we bought time with the limb. I uh, wasn't sure uh, how it was going to operate past this two days till we got later figuring out how much power we really had to make that enable. But I knew we bought time, and the limb was good. As soon as I went down, uh, started the power up, and Jim Lovell joined me, uh, nothing had been damaged in the limb. So I knew we had a homestead uh, that we could operate from, and with the people on the ground losing a lot of sleep, uh, they could figure out, uh, work through these ch challenges, sort of one after another. We never, we never really got to the cliff where you're about to fall off in, in the mission. So I, you know, I never got to, people ask, I never got to feel in, we weren't going to make it. Thank you, Fred. I want to start discussing with all of you your thoughts about moving forward. Do you want to say something, Bill? Okay. Russ, too. Get right back to you. I was going to add to that that there never was any sense in the control center either that we were uh, going to lose the crew. There was always things to do. And, 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 and again, we probably want to mention, it's too bad Glenn can't be here. He's kind of sick. But Glenn did a marvelous job in, in getting everything smoothed out from the from that situation, so he's he, he contributed a great deal to that. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, you. not at all. But let me follow up on that. I mean, you made an important po point earlier as well. Is it a good thing that it happened on 13 versus an earlier mission? You, you're already almost kind of a well-oiled machine, and you could look into a contingency plan like that. Well, yeah, there were a lot of good things about it. Uh, we it, it, it could have happened in a whole lot worse place. And of course, we had the lunar module, and we had a, a, a crew, and, and and because of circumstances, there was a, a a tour. They were getting ready to make a tour of the lunar module, and and transmitting it down to the Earth, and and the and the networks didn't care about that anymore. You know, space was old hat, so you had to go to the control center at that time in order to see that. So there were a lot of extra people available. Mm -hmm just to see the, the tour through the command uh, the uh, lunar module. Mm -hmm. So all that worked out good, very fortuitous, or divine guidance, however you want to look at it. Okay, thank you. 
You know, one thing that uh, the limb guys would appreciate is that the limb actually, uh, the limb batteries actually recharge the uh, entry batteries of the command module. That was a technique worked out by uh, Dick Thorson and Bill, and, uh, Bill Lindner, uh, and they uh, they realized that they had a, they could trickle charge those batteries off a limb battery. So thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Rusty, I've never missed a space shuttle launch. Read all about and learn all about your experiences. What, why haven't we been back? Why do you think that, I mean, it, it captivated the country. Why can't it do it again? And, and do you think it will? Well, you know, the moon was in exactly the right place to, with a tremendous amount of courage, uh, political courage, as well as human courage and technological challenge, the moon was in exactly the right place, in a sense, to say, let's go to the moon. We, mm -hmm. We're going to send a person to the moon and bring them back uh, alive. Um, the next steps are not quite that easy, quite that obvious. The debate between going back to the moon and going on to Mars, or going to Mars without going back to the moon first, uh, have, have raged for, uh, for years, and uh, still do, uh, in, in that sense. Um, so it, 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 there's not the same uh, uh, opportunity in, in some sense that we had at that time. But I think in, in, in many ways, uh, the most important thing in terms of a sense of challenge and moving out, really moving forward, uh, is one of age. I mean, any time you get a bureaucracy, whether that's a private corporation or government, where the average age uh, increases by one year every year, you're in trouble. And uh, uh, there's a huge difference when you see, uh, you don't see much about Blue Origin yet and, and Jeff Bezos, but we will. Uh, but when you see SpaceX uh, launch uh, something with the Falcon 9 or whatever, and then, or the Falcon Heavy, and bring back uh, two first stages and land them in formation, you know and uh, the cameras are there in SpaceX's headquarters, and they show all these kids. You know, they're 20 years old, for God's sake, and they're hooting and hollering and screaming. They've all been, they did it. I mean, that is that is what it takes. NASA used to be that way. Uh, it, it's not anymore, nor is any uh, uh, long-term government bureaucracy. So part of the real uh, juice, it seems to me, in space exploration in the future is encouraging the private uh, activities in space. And uh, that today is where most of the juices are flowing. Uh, and getting young people involved is really the key, uh, giving them the opportunity. I mean, Jeff Bezos uh, says it very well. I mean, his fundamental motivating uh, thing in, in, in terms of his commitment to space is to reduce the cost so that more and more people can take part directly and therefore dramatically increase the, let me say, the quality and the opportunity for innovation out of the, the human, the natural human creativity. Uh, so as the cost of getting into space drops, the creativity will dramatically increase. And that, that, that's, that's where it's at in the future, it seems to me. You asked about the, uh, the space shuttle, and uh, I think over the years, 30 years or so, that uh, the public at large and also within the agency, they had a tendency to neglect some of the stuff at the beginning. They had two shuttles that were lost. Uh, personally, I think they were both preventable, presently, if, if we had awakened to it. Except for that, I would have to say that, in my opinion, the space shuttle is the greatest flying machine ever built by man, period. Jack uh, Harrison, rather, <laughs> will remember this. He... he uh, Jack had a conference after the uh, 
Apollo program had ended, that he had some grant money, I think, left at Caltech, and he put a group of us together. Uh, There's 28, I've counted them more than once, and there were all kinds of people, lunar geologists and, and um, uh, astronauts and management and uh, a flight director, which, because I had worked with him on 17, he, I guess that's why you selected me. Um, or, or, my last choice. Yeah, 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 everybody else turned you down, so you... <laughs> Um, but anyway, we, we talked about a, a lot of things at this conference, and it was kind of a summarizing time for me. How did we do it? Uh, how did we pull it off? Uh, and we all had, and we talked about the lunar science and what we got out of it and so forth. But on the idea of how did we make this happen? Uh, we had all kinds of ideas being thrown out, and you know we commented that well we were pretty damn good, you know, and we were, you know, we we knew what we were doing, and and I guess that was true to a certain extent. And in typical fashion, Neil Armstrong was at that meeting, and he was uh, in typical fashion very quiet, didn't have much to say, and when it came his time to talk as also was his, his moniker, he, everybody listened, because he was usually dead on. And he had an interesting thing, uh, Rusty, about how, you know, how, how did it happen and, and that sort of thing. And, and here's the, let me summarize it. He, he got up on a blackboard and he actually uh, drew these parabolas, these curves that were out of phase, and he labeled one threat, he labeled one bold leadership, he labeled another one public support and resources. That was his four basic tenets. He said most of the time, those things are out of sequence with each other. You may have a threat, but you don't have the resources to do much about it. He said it was a perfect storm when Apollo happened. We had the Soviet threat. We had bold leadership that said, let's go do it. We had a balanced budget in the early 1960s. We had the resources, and we had the human resources, primarily from WW2 with our aviation industry, which Grumman played a big part in that. So we, and then we had the public support. He said, if it hadn't been Apollo, it would have been something else that would have happened in that time frame. And he said, when the Soviets launched, launched Sputnik and then Gagarin, the threat was clearly defined and the leadership responded and everything else fell into line. I thought it was the best explanation, typical Neil Armstrong, very thoughtful. And, uh, and he probably said it better than I did, but it was really, really good. And I, I think he's right and I think Nowadays, we've got a threat right now. I'd I say it's China. I think you've been there. Yeah, it, those guys are good. They're really good at this. It's a technological threat now, but it could be more later. Leadership, draw your own conclusion. Uh, uh, bold sometimes, all right? Uh, resources, we haven't had them. And the public support has been up and down. But I'm an optimist. I think we're on a track that's going to get us there. Uh, it may not be this, this particular emphasis that we got right now with Orion uh, and, and a launch vehicle and no lander. Step up, Grumman. <laughs> Come on. We need, one. We need a lander bad. And uh, so if we're going to make 2024, uh, I don't know whether that's awful tight, but of course I didn't think, I was, I was like Fred, I didn't think we could probably land on the moon in the decade of the 60s, and we did. So who knows, maybe if American industry and, and the combination, uh, all the things line up a little better than they are right now, maybe we can make 2024. If not, we could do it in 2028 maybe or something. But anyway, let's do it.
are you on your list of questions? I, I, can, I, huh? I, I, don't, I, don't, I got the mic here. I'd like to say something. For Go you. ahead. I'm about to wrap things up. Okay. Uh, as I was looking over uh, this slideshow we just saw, and it went through the list of, uh, of, of, of launches and, and it crews on there, and, and also as I was watching a, uh, a movie of, of Apollo 11 that's currently playing in uh, regular theaters, uh, it's, it, it doesn't have actors in it, it's just got show, it's a documentary. I don't know how many of y'all have seen that, is that in this part of, that, that, if, you ha if you haven't seen it, you need to see that. But the thing that struck me is, how many of those people are not with us anymore? And how much they contributed to it, and, 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 and the large number of people, some of which are here, obviously, and all over the country. And uh, it, to me, it's remarkable that, that uh, the various people that contributed to the, to the program, and, and it's also remarkable how many of them have gone away. Thank you. If I... That conference we had in Cal at Caltech that Jerry just referred to was really a, a remarkable educational experience for the people that were there. The, uh, but I just want to mention, at the same time that we were doing all of this, there was a comparable program going on that we didn't know much about, and that was the development of the nuclear navy. And, it, and, and I just happened to think, Jerry, that the same kind of cycles came into being to create the nuclear navy. Now, the one thing the navy did is that they put in place and still have in the nuclear part of the navy, and, and through, well, actually, it probably happens throughout the uh, service, is that they stay young. They rotate people so they stay young. NASA needs to learn how to do it. We need to give them the authority under civil service rules to stay young. It makes all the difference in the world. That gives you the courage, the stamina, the patriotism, motivation, everything that young people bring, including the fact that they haven't failed yet, for the most part. And I think that had a lot to do with what uh, Jerry and Milt had, had talked about. Thank you. <laughs> Gentlemen, I, I want to thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, personally, this is uh, a top five career moment for me to be able to listen to you. Um, thank you for inspiring my career in science. Uh, you're a part of a, a very exclusive club now. All of us here tonight got a rare chance to listen to some of your experiences. Um, your reach, your service goes well beyond the Apollo years for all such distinguished men. Um, thank you for being here tonight. I, I hope uh, that you enjoy the anniversary of the moon landing. And thanks for participating in all of this, and I hope everyone out here enjoyed the evening. <laughs>